Three, two, one, and we're live. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of the Village Made Podcast. My name is Mavel Moli, and uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be a Polynesian. And these are our stories, and our stories are powerful. And today we have Mia Jensen. <laughs> so Mia Jensen is also from Laie, but we'll get into her story, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, I think what she does is cool. And so that's why I, uh, I asked her to be on and to share her story. And it's inspiring as well. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right. Let's get into it, <laughs> okay. you know, with your name. So Mia Jensen, but mm-hmm. I guess just uh, tell us the story of your name, who named you, and the, the meaning of your last name. Okay. Well, I guess. My maiden yeah, name. Yeah, your maiden okay. name. And also yeah, <laughs> yeah, with Jensen, if you have that as well. I share a little bit of well. Jensen. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So my name's Miyamoto Loretta Wilson. Last name now, Jensen. Um, so Miyamoto is my second great-grandmother's last name on my Japanese side. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I know a lot of people when they see my name, they're like, okay, they're expecting a Japanese girl. And then I show up and it's like, Ooh, you're Polly. (laughs) Totally different story. But, um, so when my mom was pregnant with me, my dad, they didn't know if I was going to be a boy or girl. And every time they did the ultrasound, they couldn't tell what was, they're like, well, her legs are closed, so we don't know. (laughs) So, um, my dad was looking through my mom's pedigree chart and as he was looking at it he saw my mom's great grandmother's name Taka Miyamoto from Japan and um, he just felt inspired that that should be my first name and so my mom thought it was crazy but my dad's like we're gonna do this this is gonna be her name if it's a girl and we'll call her Mia for short and then Loretta is my dad's sister's name so she passed away in October 1992 of a failed heart transplant uh, surgery. She was actually the first woman in California to get a heart transplant. So she died in 1992, and then I was born January 93. So I was named after both those women. And um, and then Wilson is from my dad's name, obviously. And um, his father, Yosefa Wilson, is from Samoa. And so we're part of the Wilson family there. <coughs> And yeah, so those were where my names come from. And then Jensen is my husband's last name from Idaho. <laughs> Idaho farm boy. His, yeah. <laughs> nice. And then with your dad, do you know uh, what villages he was? He's from in Samoa? Yes. So, um, oh, my mind just went blank. I know his mom's side, the Tubuivao side, is from Alau. And that's where my dad was born in American Samoa. Nice. And then his, the Wilson side, is from Samoa. I can't remember exactly where, but yeah, yeah, from Samoa. And do you know Mm -hmm. any of your moms, the Japanese or any? Sure. Yeah. So my mom, so my mom's Hawaiian, Japanese, German, and um, we had German immigrants come to Hawaii on Kauai Island to settle the Lutheran church there. So that's where her German side comes from. And they married into um, the Hawaiians there. And so that's where my Hawaiian side from that side comes from. Um, they were mainly from Kauai and Oahu. And then the Japanese side, they're from southern Japan. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And then they all just, they all had to mingle together. And that's where I come from. <laughs> and um, with your dad being from Samoa, do you know their mm-hmm. migration story? Yes, I do. Mm-hmm. So, um, my grandma, my dad's mom, she actually, when she was about 12 years old, she she told me recently that she felt inspired that she needed to leave American Samoa to come to America. And she was only a kid, right? And she's telling her parents, you need to leave, you need to let me go to go to America. And they were not too happy with that. Right. They were just like, no, you're too young. You don't know what you're talking about. But she kept on egging them about it, saying, I need to go. I need to, I, I know this is what God needs me to do. And she wasn't a religious person. She was very much into the Father Samoa way, right? And she wasn't a member of our church that we are now. And um, so finally her parents were like, okay, we'll let you go to Hawaii and go to Kahuku High School, you know? And that's where um, her uncle was living in Laie. So they sent her there and she stayed there for a while. And then even there, she felt like she needed to still leave. She's like, I can't. I don't know why, but I don't, I don't feel like I should be here. And 
later on she found out that she had a sister that she didn't know about from her mom's first marriage. Oh, wow. And she was like, I have a sister? And so she found who her sister was, and her sister lived in California. And so she made a connection with her. They talked, and she just decided to leave her uncle and just go straight to California. And so she left them behind, and she got to the airport. We didn't have cell phones back then, right? right. And I was like, Grandma, how did you find your sister? And she's like, well, I was walking around the airport, and I saw a lady who was walking like my mom did. She was like, I noticed the way she held herself and how her body moved. It's like that, she must be my sister. And so they saw each other and they were like, are you, are you? And they're like, yes. And so, you know, she said that they embraced and they were so happy to see each other. Her sister was already married. And so that's where um, she was, at least on this side of the marriage, the second marriage. Um, to be the first one to come to the continental U.S. And from then on, she brought all of her other siblings there and her parents. So that's that's how my family, at least on my Samoan side, got to America. Such a cool story. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she's pretty... Uh, I love my grandma. I love talking to her. And she's just... She's feisty and resilient. And when she wants to do something, she will do it no matter what. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm, I'm not too surprised that she was able to do that at such a young age. She's yeah. just incredible. That's cool. And mm-hmm. so where were you born and raised? Sure. So I was born at, well, if we're being technical, Moanalua, Honolulu, <laughs> at Kaiser Hospital. Right. <laughs> at what time in the morning? It was in the morning. Okay. I was born, I think. And, um, but I was raised in Laie most of my life. Yeah, mostly there, but we moved when I was in the middle of elementary school to Eva Beach, and um, we were there for about five years, but then moved back to La'ie. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So um, what was childhood like for you, being raised uh, in La'ie and then also in Eva? And then were, yeah. were there differences in growing up in oh, those two yeah. places? <laughs> so um, I would say overall my childhood was really fun. I just remember... Um, always coming home and going straight to the beach because both my parents love the water and especially my dad. He's he's full-blooded as someone, but he is in love with the ocean and loves surfing. And so we always were at Hukilau Beach swimming. And um, I remember not, I, I just remember not ever not swimming. <laughs> he was always at the beach. Um, and then I had a lot of cousins too. So my mom, she has a lot of her Hawaiian side in Laie too. And so that's where they all got together and had a bunch of kids too. And so what, I grew up with a bunch of kids. Were those families? Or? Yeah, so the Mongolays. Okay. So, um, yeah, we have the Mongolays, the Reeds, um, oh, wow. the Kalamas. So that's like They're my family. family. Oh, yeah. yeah, big families. And so it was just super fun. Like we were always together having a good time. And so, um, and I'm the oldest of five children, so I always had children around me, just mm. loved it. And then when we moved to Eva Beach, it was, it was a little different, you know, we didn't have as many cousins around or family members, but we still learned to make friends with so many other people, especially in our ward and church. And I still remember having just a tribe, a village all around me, no matter where I went. So, um, then we moved back to Laie and... It just felt like we were just walking right back in, you know, nothing yeah. really changed. And all of us were just a little older. So, yeah, it was wonderful. A great childhood. So, I know you mentioned that you had uh, gone to Kamehameha. Yes. What was that like? You know, because we're <laughs> our, our for all over here. Yeah. yeah just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, was it for the education or was it for mm-hmm. just the Hawaiian, you know, like to learn the Hawaiian yeah. language? Or what was that decision or? That's a great question. No, that's a great question. I think it was a mixture of everything. Um, I just knew I really wanted a good education. I'm not saying Kuhuku doesn't have that, right? But um, I don't know. I just I just felt like I needed to go there. And my family was like, Yeah, we should and we've been trying to go for years. I tried on fourth grade, seventh grade, nothing. Seventh grade waitlisted, but you know. So (laughs) it wasn't until ninth grade that I finally got in. And um yeah, I I just remember going there and yeah, it was hard, you know, waking up at yeah, five in the morning I imagine. to go catch the school bus and ride an hour there 
and have school from like 7.30 to 3.30 every day. And then I played sports too, so I had practices afterwards and then carpooling home and just doing it over and over again. It was a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it was a lot, but it was Did great. Did you have other siblings that went with you to camp? Or yes. were there other like people from Laia that went to camp with oh, you? Oh, yeah. There was... So, I was the first out of my cousins on the North Shore to get into Kamehameha. And then ever since then, every single cousin basically has gone. There's only okay. been like one or two that haven't. But And there's a lot of us. So it was it was fun, too. That's yeah. where I had my cousins with me. and um, the, So there's three of us girls in my family in that order and then two boys. So all three of us girls and then the last or one boy just graduated from high school there. So, yeah, we have a lot of experience and yeah. a lot of traction there as a family. Nice. Yeah. And um, growing up, was <clears throat> um, culture a big thing that was taught in the home, maybe like with language or with like customs or etiquettes? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. We, um, you know, I realized as I've grown up that children, a lot of times, at least in our family, the pattern is that the children take after their mother's side and their culture. So that's where I have strong connections to my Hawaiian side, mainly. And of course, we're going Kamehameha. It's like, yeah, yeah. it's inevitable, right? And so, um, you know, I was mainly taught the Hawaiian culture, the Hawaiian values of love and respect and of honoring your elders and um, being a good child, being a good daughter, a good sister. Um, you know, I did hula growing up quite a bit and... Um, I will say going to Kamehameha, I didn't take Hawaiian language classes, though I wish I did. <laughs> I took Japanese, which was very helpful when I served my mission in Japan. But um, I did learn the culture even more so because my mom was so proud to be Hawaiian too. And But you know, we lived it in our own way, right. if that makes sense. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And growing up, um, was it hard finding your identity? You know, as a Polynesian American, right? With, no, with Polynesian, it's your uh, German, or not German, sorry, mm -hmm. your Samoan, Hawaiian, you uh -huh. know what I mean? And then also with the American. Mm -hmm. Was it hard navigating, you know, and trying to find your identity as someone of Polynesian and also like German and Japanese descent, oh, but yeah. living in America? Oh, yes. Yes, it was. And I didn't realize how much of a struggle I had with my identity until I grew up. You know, I left home. But being at home, even going to Kamehameha, being surrounded by every Native Hawaiian there, I still felt like I wasn't Native Hawaiian enough. And But then at the same time, it's like, well, I feel like compared to my Samoan side, I'm not Samoan enough. <laughs> I don't even know my Samoan language. Like, I can't even do a bunch of things that I, I see a lot of my other Samoan friends and community members doing. And... Um, and then on top of that, uh, being American, at Kamehameha, we don't celebrate, like, statehood, Hawaii statehood. Right. You know, we don't celebrate Columbus Day, any of that. It's just like, no. You, you know, and when it comes to the overthrow, the anniversary, it's it's a day of mourning for us. And um, being American, it's like, well, how... I, I don't know how to honor being American because I am proud and thankful for my rights and my privileges here. But then the history that's happened, it's like, I almost feel like I'd be a disgrace to my ancestors for honoring this part of my Americana, you know? Right. And so, yeah, it's gotten more complex as I've gotten older, but definitely in my youth, it, I didn't realize how much of a struggle it would be until later. So yeah, it's it was hard. And um, with your identity today, do you feel like you have a better idea or better understanding of who you are and your identity? Or is that always like culture? You know, I feel like mm -hmm. culture is always evolving. Culture mm -hmm. is always changing. Yes. And I feel like identity, <coughs> excuse me, identity, mm -hmm. you know, like depends on people, you know, from person to person. But sometimes identity can change as well, you know. And so how do you feel about that with your personal identity? Yeah. Um I would say that I do have a better grip of who I am and who I want to be. But I think that's the beautiful part, too, of me still not knowing all of that yet. And you're right. Culture evolves because people evolve. Yeah. And so it's like, so that means I will still be finding myself as I grow up. Right. And instead of me being like, oh, that's like a scary thing, I'm more excited about it. It's like, 
yeah, who am I going to be in the next year or even a few more years? I don't know. And But as long as I strive to be a good person and strive to perpetuate our culture in my own way, and I, I think that is just me honoring my identity and my identity is all of my ancestors too. It's not just me now. Right. I'm the living, all of us, we're the living embodiment of all our ancestors in the past. So, yeah. I've, uh, on Instagram, I've put up a post. I forget, I don't know who wrote it, but it just says that we're our ancestors' wildest dreams. Yes. And so I feel like, you know, just like what you're talking about, like they would have tripped out if they seen an airplane, you know? <laughs> yeah. Because all they knew was a canoe, you know, mm-hmm. and they're navigating with stars. I know. <laughs> but today we just fly using compasses That's or you right. know what I mean technology Easy and so time. but mm-hmm. at the same time you know there's some of the values that we cherish or that we hold on to from our ancestors mm-hmm. that you know are still you know um of value to us and that we still can use yeah. especially you with uh, you know with uh, a kid mm-hmm. you know and trying to pass that on to him you know yeah. I'm sure that a lot of the values and just the legacy that you want to leave with them um with your grandma, she's still alive, right? She you is. Saying? Mm-hmm. And so you ever talk to her and just be like, hey, grandma? Or, you know, for you, mm-hmm. would you say with the person that you've become and the person that you are today mm-hmm. and the choices that you've made that your grandparents, you know, your grandma, would mm-hmm. be proud of you for the sacrifices that she's made to move her family here or to be here, you know? Yeah, I, I would say that she is. She's very proud. And... um I just remember as a child, she always told me that she only wanted a few things for her grandchildren and just the rest of her posterity was to serve a mission and to get married in the temple. And um, so far, I've been able to accomplish both of those things. And I'm not saying that I live my life according to that, but I will say that that just my choices alone, separate from what her expectations were, actually did fulfill her dreams and I'm I'm happy that it did. Right. I'm so happy that it did. And she's she's always so proud of that. And um but I would hope too that even for my siblings who have not done those things yet or ever will, that it's okay, you know. I, I understand that we want to honor our elders and our those who come before us. But I would say most importantly to those who are living their own lives and doing their own thing, it's okay. Like I, it's hard when you have these people that you love and you revere and you feel like you're just disappointing them. And I think there's so many people in our culture that feel that way, that they, yeah, my, my grandma, she sacrificed so much. She did all these things for me and she has these expectations, but it's like, but that's not what you want to do. How do you, how do you reckon with that? How do you live your life? I, I don't know. It's mm-hmm. so different for everybody. But I would say um, just me talking to whoever is going to listen to this is that you're not alone. And I hope that you would feel that there is so many of us who feel the same exact way as they do. And it's okay. Yeah. I feel like at the end of the day, just do what makes you happy. You know? Yeah. Yeah. If uh, exactly. if it all goes wrong, at least you know you're happy. At least I'm happy. Yeah, <laughs> but at the yeah. same time, if you're you know with you being happy, if you fulfill, mm-hmm. like uh, living your best life or doing everything that you fulfill, you know, being fulfilled, mm-hmm. then that in turn, your parents will be happy, or you know, your ancestors yeah. will be happy because you're happy because right. you fulfilled, or you've done what you know makes you happy and exactly. you're fulfilled. So, yeah. I like that. But um, yeah, you know, talking about uh, especially because um. You know, this is the Village Made podcast, and so there's a lot of villagers, you know, a lot Mm -hmm. of people from the village. And so Mm -hmm. just in the people that I've had on, you know, everyone has had, or there's just looking at the village, right? There's so many different people with different talents. And so the talent that, you know, that, that inspired me and that drove me to like what you're doing is this genealogy work that you do. Mm -hmm. And so on Instagram, you are known as the Polynesian genealogist. Yes. And so, man, where did that start for you? How did that start? And, um, yeah, I guess just where did you get your inspi- inspiration from? Because, mm-hmm. um, especially for me, when I think about it, genealogy is something for, like, the old folks, right? Yeah. Like, it's just kind of boring or, you know, it's mm-hmm. just like, eh. mm-hmm. <laughs> But for you, such a young person, you know, and it drives you and it's your, actually your occupation. Yes. Like, where did that, yeah, 
where did it come from or how did it start for you? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I hope I don't get too emotional about this, but oh well. So I, it, it started in my youth where I, I recognized at a very young age, I loved being around the elders in my family. I loved hearing their stories and um, just listening to them talk was something that I was like, yeah, this is really cool. And plus, I, I guess it was an excuse to get away from babysitting all the younger kids and cousins, right? And so I, I loved that part. And then I recognized, too, that I really enjoyed knowing the story of people's names. I would ask my friends since elementary, I'm like, How, what's your full name? Because, you know, everybody has like a nickname, yeah? Oh, yeah? And so I'm like, wait, what's your full name? And they'll say it. I'm like, well, how did you get your name? They're like, why do you want to know? I'm like, I'm just curious. I'd like to know. And and they always thought it was weird. And so at some point I was like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't ask that question. But um, I just love people's names. And I remembered people's names. And I later on I realized, I'm like, oh, that's actually kind of a gift to remember <laughs> names yep. and their stories or their names. And then fast forward to when I was serving a mission in Japan and I was happy to be in at least one of my ancestral homelands of Japan. Right. And it was just like, yeah, this is so cool. You know, I'm living amongst the Japanese people, my people. And, um, and I was learning the language and I was doing pretty well. But, you know, I struggled a lot with depression on my mission and anxiety, a lot of that. And definitely a lot of homesickness. And just the mental health that I had was it was hard to deal with. And for those who may know what it's like to be a missionary, it's very demanding. It's a very rigorous life. And what I was living in college compared to my mission was there's a stark contrast. And so I just remember going downhill mentally on my mission and um, to the point where I couldn't get up to go serve and to do the work. I was just crying a lot. I couldn't sleep, but then slept all day. And at that point, too, I was training another young missionary straight from the MTC. Right. And she, her and I were the same age. And she, I remember her getting to know her, and she was like, I love family history. And I was like, what? Why do you love family history? It's for old people. Right. And she was saying, well, no, it's fascinating, all the things I'm learning, the stories, and I just love doing it. I'm like, well, I like indexing. And she's like, well, I hate indexing. There's so much more you can do besides indexing with family history work. And with her testimony of family history and then also the love and the reverence I saw the Japanese people had for their ancestors was so moving to me. I was like, that is so different from what I've seen. People would bring food to the Japanese graves and pray and give incense there and i was just like that is it to me it was like that is a manifestation of love that just was so inspiring to me but back to the mental health so i was going downhill and then at seven and a half months on my mission i decided i was like you know what it was my 21st birthday where i made the call and i was like i need to go home and that was heartbreaking to go home and I was mainly scared of what everybody else would think of me because there's this reputation mm. if you come home. Knowing where we come from. Early, people yeah. People talk about, yeah. yeah. And everybody knows, yeah. Right. It's not like, oh, you can like go yeah. hide away. No, everybody knows. You're home, everybody knows. And so I was scared of what people would think of me. And But I went home anyways because I knew that's what I needed to do. And um, I went home and I went to the temple every day for a full month and because I knew I needed that sanctuary, that solace for me. And I found so much grace in the temple and peace and just a lot of strength that I didn't realize that I needed. I didn't realize how weak I was until I recognized how strong I got over time. And so I was at, and then I became a temple worker and I was so excited to, um, to serve in the temple because I was like, well, I don't know if I'll go back on my mission. So, and I was going to therapy and just doing a lot of like ocean therapy to go to the beach a lot, spending time with my family. But as I worked in the temple, I noticed the difference between people bringing their family names and the temple names that were there. And I just felt such a overwhelming feeling when I helped people with their ancestors and their ancestors' names. 
And I was like, I want a piece of that. That just feels so good. And so my grandma was visiting from the Big Island around that time when I was like, I need to do family history work. And she, I called her up and I was like, grandma. And before I could even ask her, she's like, let me guess. You <laughs> want to go to the family history center and you want to learn how to do family history work. I was like, yeah, I do actually. How did you know? She's like, just meet me in about an hour and I'll teach you. And she sat me down and she pulled up family search and she said, this is family search and this is your family tree. And she just walked me through how to find names, how to look for records. And I was blown away. I was like, this is, this is it? This is and she was like, yeah, this is about it. This is family history work. And, you know, I stayed up late all the time just researching. And I just loved it. I was so hooked on it. And I, over time, as I was trying to do my Samoan side especially, I would hit so many walls because there was, you know, some records. I was like, there's no records. There's no, nothing written down. And people were telling me, well, there's oral history. Especially because we're oral history mm -hmm. people, oral you know? Societies, yeah. Exactly. And people were telling me, well, because it's oral, you can't do your family history mm. work. And I, I'm the kind of person that refuses to get a no until I know for myself it's an actual no. <coughs> so I was like, no, I'm going to figure something out. I'm going to do something about this. So, I mean, I was called to do family history in, in the BYU singles ward, the local ward. And then I came back to school. I was called in family history as well. And BYU has a family history major. And they're the only school in the world that has that. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, of all places, I'm going to BYU already. And then. So I think that's the cool part, you know, that mm -hmm. whatever you find your passion in or whatever, mm -hmm. you, you know, you find that your purpose is. There's ways to make money, right? Oh. Or so, you know. And then, so can you talk about how you got into working with, was it Family Search, yes. you said? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just that knowing that you can make money from it, you know? Yeah. You know, and that's part of the reason why I went into this work, too. Because when I was single and trying to find my husband, I was like, hey, I, I, yeah, I want to get married. But I also want to have a family. And I want to work, though. And... I was like, I can do family history and work from home and be a mom and a wife, and this will be cool. So that's that's another reason why I got into it. So I graduated from BYU in 2018, but with my major, I was required to do a lot of, to do internships and a lot of different classes. So as a heads up right now, at least, BYU does not have a Polynesian emphasis. I made that myself. I was... I went into the department head's office. I sat down. I told her, I'm like, I want to do Polynesian genealogy. And she's like, okay, <laughs> let's, let's, okay. Is there it out. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, we don't have any classes on this topic, but I think we can tweak a few things here and there for you. I was like, sweet. And so she mapped out my classes for me, said, yeah, maybe we can figure out things here and there for you. So I did that, but then I also did, um, I did internships at the Family History Library. I did internship at the Hawaii State Archives. So I was there in the summer 2017, and I was helping to archive legislative records, and I got to view a lot of other Native Hawaiian records that no one else gets to see, so that was really cool. And then um, I interned at the Church History Department after I graduated from BYU. I was um, cataloging or preserving oral histories from all over the world. But I was mainly wow. given oral histories from the Pacific because I knew the language and the culture. And I helped to transcribe some of those interviews as well. So all of that experience led to me now working at Family Search. But I should say, though, in between that time, so I graduated in 2018 and I moved to Idaho um, January 2019. And I was expecting to just be working from home and getting clients here and there. I'm like, yeah, people are going to hire me. I'm going to be a hot commodity. It'll be great. That did not happen <laughs> at all. And um, that was devastating to me because I was like, listen, I've been hustling. I've been doing all these internships. Why is this not working out for me? And um, at that time, too, my husband got injured, on, you know, his back got injured. And so um, I already was the main breadwinner of the family, but then that reality became even more real after my husband got hurt. And so I was like, okay, well, I got to figure something out. So I, um, I was a substitute teacher at the local schools there in Idaho, but then that wasn't enough. 
and I applied for a job position to be a graveyard housekeeper at the Meridian Idaho Temple. And I did some custodial work in college before I got into family history. So that kind of helped me in the interview, but I got hired. And I will say that it was rough in that job, not only because the schedule was insane. I was working from 7.30 p.m. to 4 in the morning, Whoa. and the temple was about an hour away from where I was living. So I drove through blizzards. <sighs> I, I felt like I was going to die every night. I, and the work was intense. I've never been pushed so hard before in my life, mentally, physically, and emotionally. And I think the hardest part was, like, I didn't go to school to be a housekeeper. I went to school to be a genealogist, right. a famous and professional one, and <laughs> this is not it. And so, but I will say that that time in my life is one of the most sacred moments of my life. I was there for 10 months, and I learned things in there that I couldn't learn anywhere else. And it prepared me for where I am now today, and oh. it will prepare me and hold me through the rest of my life because of that time. You know, I, I learned how to clean a toilet really well, but at the same time, I learned to listen to God more fully as I cleaned. I learned how to find um, discrepancies in carpets and find little stains here and there on white carpet. I learned how to brush goat hair that are on the altars in the temple and on chairs. And one of the best lessons I learned, though, was when I was cleaning a hallway that was just white carpet and there were some stains, like black stains in it. And I was in there for over an hour and my supervisor came in and she was like, are you okay? It's like, I'm not okay. This is taking me forever. I'm tired and I don't want to be here. And she looked at me, she said, you know, Mia, it's wonderful that there's stains here because this is proof that people have come to the temple to do the work for their ancestors. And I was, ugh, I was humbled so badly at that moment. And for me, it was like, I'm not only here at the temple to prepare the house of the Lord for people to come do their work for their ancestors. I'm also doing genealogy work that prepares people to come and be ready to receive the ordinances on behalf of their families. And what a blessing that was to be on both sides of that. Yeah. And I'll never, ever, ever forget that. And all of that led to us, me getting hired by Family Search. They were, um, I had my, my current supervisor, she messaged me on Facebook. She said, hey, are you looking for a job? And I was like, hmm, uh, yeah. I were would you like searching it. at the time for I that? Was, I oh, was. Nice. I was like, yeah, I'm looking for <laughs> whatever. You know, I was, but at that point, we weren't going to move back to Utah either. We were planning on staying in Idaho forever. And... Um, but she's like, yeah, we're opening up a position at Family Search, um, a contract position where we need someone to research Polynesian oral genealogies. And I was like, really? Wow. And she's like, I know we we would like to, you know, have you apply. And, um, you know, so she sent me the scope of the job. And it involves, yes, looking, researching into oral genealogies, um, understanding their nature and their scope writing reports for them, and then also um, researching records that support oral genealogies. And so I applied for the job, and they gave it to me. And, I mean, it was a miracle. It really was. And I got that job. Um, I was hired right before the pandemic happened. And it was February of this year, 2020. Mm -hmm. And I was just finishing presenting at Roots Tech. I presented a class on Polynesian genealogy there. And um, yeah, that's where everything worked out. I got my computer and laptop from Family Search. Worked from home in Idaho until we moved here in May. My husband got back into BYU to finish his undergrad, and so I'm like, well, we're moving back to Provo. <laughs> but you know, all of that again, kind of. I know that kind of sidetracked, but going back to this idea of like you can have a career in this, absolutely. Like this is a big and budding field, and right now I'm the only. One. I imagine. The only <laughs> one. That's the only one I've known, at least. You yes, know what I, mean? I Well, I do know one other person who um, has accreditation in Hawaiian genealogy as well, oh. which I'm like, yes, that's my homie. But I'm, I'm trying. My goal is to master and know the methodology for all of Oceania, not just Hawaii. Right. I'm like, I want to help everybody. 
I'm not going to limit myself. Yeah. So, yeah. And, you know, um, just speaking of limiting yourself, sometimes not only as, you know, like in our career fields, but also mm -hmm. in life or, you know, just in every, any facet, you know, we limit ourselves. And so yeah. what do you feel like as Polynesians we have to offer the world? Oh, I love that question. Um, I think we have everything to offer. I don't think there's anything that we could not offer to right. the world. Um, you know, before we started recording, we were talking about all the many talents that our people have. It's like, listen, God's not withholding himself from any of us, from our people at all. If anything, he is outpouring his love and his abundance upon us. And his expectation for us as a people is to use it to bless everybody else. So yeah. if you're out there and you're like, well, I only have this. Well, why not you? Why not? Can't, like you can make a difference. It doesn't have to be this grand scale. Like I'm going big. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to bless everybody. I'm, I'm all for it. <laughs> but right. it doesn't have to be as big and grander as that. It can just be as simple as just being nice, being kind. And there's so many people... Listen, there's so many people that love Polynesians and they want to be close right. to Polynesians. Like, I've seen that here in Utah, especially. How many people are like, yeah, you're just so cool. I want to be your friend. and which is, which is fine. It's great. And I think it's mainly because we have this, um, we have this power and this, this love that radiates from all of us. For sure. And um, we just, all of us have so much potential just, oh, I, I can't get over how much potential we have. And I wish more of our people would see that in themselves. And, and we're just barely really, tapping into it, right? Yes. And um, I guess with me just sharing, like, why I started this, you know, it's yeah. just, just letting people know that there's other people, you know, in the fields or different fields that mm -hmm. we're in, you know, with mm -hmm. you being in genealogy. Who knows? There's somebody listening that'd be like, oh, I wanted to get into genealogy, yeah. but I never knew that I could get paid from it. You know, yes. I didn't know how that you can, you know, make money or make a living from it. And mm -hmm. so with you sharing your story, you know, mm -hmm. it, it ho it'll hopefully uh, inspire someone else, you know. Yes. And so just not only because you said you and maybe another person are the only mm -hmm. two in genealogy yeah. that you know of. Mm -hmm. Who knows? You know, there could be a whole bunch coming up, you know. Yes, please. And then <laughs> especially for me in like sharing like with for especially other people who want to do podcasting yeah. and i'm just sharing like in podcasting you know yeah. like i always share or i always ask you know tell people like hey you guys should start a podcast or you should start a podcast mm -hmm. because not only is there enough room for everyone to do podcasts but mm -hmm. with the younger generation coming up i want them not only to be like uh not only to be as good as me but i want them to be better because i know yeah. that they can be you know exactly and so it's just like tapping into that potential yes. <laughs> what you're talking about yes. you know yes and i think that's what our ancestors have seen too in us right even if they haven't seen us like physically in this life they were like we are moving we are shaking we are grooving so that right. you guys can be a lot better than we are because the world is meant to improve and grow. And that can only be possible if we do that on individual levels. And if we do that, we do that as a family, we do that as a village, we do that as a nation, we do that as a world. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> but um, something I wanted to go kind of go back on. Sure. I, don't, I mean, you can share as much as you want. You don't mm -hmm. have to share, but um, just kind of, just so it doesn't go over our heads, you know? Yeah. But. I know in when you posted on Instagram, you posted about some traumas, you know, yes. some of the traumas that we have faced as, you know, culture, as a people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can we talk about a little bit of um, what you talked about with your mission uh -huh. and with depression mm -hmm. and anxiety yeah. and just the culture that surrounds not only Samoan, but, you know, there's talk, like Polynesians. Mm -hmm. I feel like we all have the same reaction towards when we hear the word anxiety or depression. Right. And I don't know, like, but for me, it's like being kind of like from a little bit older, you know, be like, mm -hmm. oh, just rub dirt in it. Or, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. oh, you're not you're serious. Mm -hmm. Or you're not, you know, this is nothing that you can't get over, you know, yeah. or somebody just telling you get over mm -hmm. it, you know. But what do we... Or what can we learn or how can we better uh, 
sorry, how can we better help those who are going through it right now? Because I feel like it's something. um, So when I interviewed my brother, he said Mm -hmm. that um, everyone in some form has anxiety. Sometimes it's as debilitating that you Mm -hmm. can't move or get out of bed, like you said. Mm -hmm. And then for some people, it's just like a thought, you know what I mean? Or maybe like 10 seconds out of their day is just, but everyone in some form has anxiety, Mm -hmm. you know? And so how do we help each other? And then how can we get this conversation going about helping each other, you know? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, How we can help each other? Or what has helped you that can help, I think, you know? Yeah. We'll start with that. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So what has helped me with dealing with depression and anxiety and it wasn't just a one-time thing either so I struggle with it here and there so I appreciate you bringing this up Um, I think it's just creating a safe space to talk about these things with um, your loved ones or with trusted family members and friends so basically um, one if you are on the side who is struggling with your mental health I would encourage you to understand that there are many people like you who are struggling to and that you can find people who can help you and listen to you. Um, But if you're on the side that's more on the caregiver side or on the side watching or being told, yeah, I struggle with this, Mm -hmm. yeah, what do you do about it? So for me, what's helped is just having someone listen and someone be there without criticizing, without putting down, um, without pushing me around. And I think that's a very common thing, too. Like you're saying, in Polynesian culture, right. it's like, eh, it's okay. Like, right. you, you'll be all right. Okay, whatever. Shake it off. But you got to understand that not everyone can just shake these things off. Some things are unshakable, and that's okay. And um, I think for me, too, with those moments that were unshakable for me, um, what helped, too, was getting therapy and... Um, just being able to talk about my therapy. I think there's such a stigma around mental health. Like I've done a lot of research on this too. And I'm, you know, I'm not a professional in mental health, but man, our people are suffering so much. I think for me, what's helped too is I'm like, I, well, I don't like pain, any kind of pain in any shape or form. Like I hate needles. I hate all that stuff. So any pain I feel, it's just like, I have a strong aversion to it. Mm-hmm. But then as I've thought of other people, I'm like, And the love that I have for family members and friends who struggle with this too, I'm like, I don't want them to feel in pain from me. Like, why would I want to inflict pain on those that I love? That's not fair or right. So that's where for me, it's, I'm like, you know, I will try to go above and beyond and just be there and listen and be kind and, um, just try to be a good person for them, someone that's in their corner. And I, I love telling my family members and friends, it's like, I always, I will always support you. I may not agree with you all the time right. and that's okay, but I will always support you. You will always have me fighting in your corner. I will always be fighting your demons with you too, if you let me, and if you're okay with me being there. And I just think acknowledging those things too, that these mental health issues are real And it's not small kind. It's not whatever. It's (laughs) legit. Just acknowledging it too will bless so many people. And, and I think too, the biggest hurdle for me was acknowledging it in myself. Just to be like, you know what? I am depressed and just tell myself it's okay. And like Kamale has been on here. She said like, it's okay to not be okay. Exactly. Being comfortable with being uncomfortable is something that we all need to do. So Overall, I think it's just mainly going out of your comfort zone, out of your way, and recognizing that these things are not bad. It's not. It doesn't hurt you. It won't hurt talking about it. People are like so scared of the words. You yeah. know, having mental literacy, even racial literacy, they're so scared of talking about these things. And it's when I've known in family history, it's when you don't talk about it that hurts people the most. That's where all the skeletons in the closet are, and they are hurting the family. They're hurting the posterity. They're hurting right. the village. And all it takes is one person to open the closet and take those skeletons out and give them a proper burial and say, peace out. This is it. I'm done. Moving on. Right? We are moving on. Yeah. We will not let this hurt us anymore. Um, 
Sorry, this just kind of this thought came to my mind, but I just wanted to see. I know you're not, you know, like a a professional or you know, like uh, someone on this, but you know, um, so our ancestors, you yes. know, they were navigators, and so we mm-hmm. navigated. You know, we moved here mm-hmm. with the migration to you know better education, better job opportunity, and stuff like that. Um, would you say, or what would what do you think about our parents? And their grandparents, did you think they had anxiety or did you think they had depression? Oh, or how yeah. did they deal with it? Oh. Or did they deal with it at all, oh. I guess? Okay, the example of my grandma. Okay. So she actually was raised by my dad's biological parents for a short time. And they, she loved them, but she knew who her real parents were. And she was living with my dad's parents and just grew up with them for several years in her youth. And then her father came over and was like, it's time for you to come home. You can't live here anymore. And she was heartbroken. And her, I even, imagine. yeah. And my dad's parents sat her down and were like, do you want to go? She's like, I don't want to go. But because I love my father, I'm going to listen to him. I'm going to obey him. I'm going to go. So she packed her bags and she went back to her parents. And um, she, in her own words, she said, I slept. I did not get up for days. I could not eat. I could not think. I cried and I just laid there on my bed for days. And she's like, I think it was even months. And my dad was really worried about me. And I asked her, like, was that depression, Grandma? And she's like, yeah, I was depressed and I was not okay. So just hearing her acknowledge that was mind blowing for me. I never thought she would. It was just my preconceived notions like, yeah, my grandma would never talk about mental health, but she was, she acknowledged it. Mm-hmm. She's like, yeah, I struggle with depression. Um, my grandma, my mom's side, my mom's mom, her husband, my grandfather, who I'm descended from, he passed away when my mom was seven and they left it behind five children. And my grandma, I know she is strong in the faith. She loves God and she knows where her husband is, but she was heartbroken. She was sad. And... You know, my my parents haven't really... Well, my dad, he got his master's in marriage and family therapy. So, oh. yeah, so we talk about mental health quite a bit. But, um, you know, I don't remember him or my mom really telling me about mental health issues. Exactly, yeah. It was never really brought up just because I think we were like, we're happy family. We're all, we're all good. Right. But, you know, as we've gotten older... There's been a lot of trauma in my family, severe trauma. And man, I've personally experienced a lot of secondary trauma. Well, my mission coming home, that was a traumatic experience. That was trauma in itself. Yeah, right. And then not going back, that was still trauma for mm-hmm. me. But other things that happened in my family have been very traumatic. And, you know, because of those events, we have been a lot more open and a lot more willing to talk to each other about our hard times. Um, I can talk to my parents and tell them, you know, I've actually been really depressed lately. And of course they love me and they care. And so they go out of the way to make sure we're okay. But yeah, I, I would say though, like even further back are, are my ancestors. I don't, I haven't found any records of them saying that they were, they were like, yeah, I'm struggling with depression or I'm feeling really anxious. It's just, it was a, this mentality of like, just suck it up and move on. And, and the thing is, I think mainly it was because of survival. Yeah. They had to in mm-hmm. order to survive, in order to keep their families alive. But I think nowadays with more opportunities, opportunities for us to have time and space, we can think about these things more yep. and acknowledge them more and still survive and thrive. Yeah. That's what I, uh, yeah, just in um, me thinking about, you know, not only depression and trauma, but I mean, uh, depression and anxiety, but and just thinking about generational trauma mm-hmm. with our parents, you know, because I I brought up that question because I always think about it, you know, like yeah. I wonder how my grandpa deals with depression or mm-hmm. anxiety or you know what I mean, like yeah. trauma or how did my grandma, you know what I mean, yeah. both sides, whether it's my mom's mm-hmm. side or dad's side, but you know, because they never talked about it. I wonder if they even had a word for it in Tongan, you know, for right. that, you know. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I feel like. Just what you're going off of what you're saying with like um, 
survival mode, you know. Our parents just moving to this country, whether it's their grandparents or our parents, mm -hmm. they had to learn a whole new language. They had to learn a whole new culture and customs and yeah. traditions, you know, mm -hmm. being American, but also trying to stay true to their, you know, their heritage. But I feel like with our generation, you know, with us coming up now, not only do we have the time, you know, but we have the luxury now, you know, yeah. to unpack these things and then hopefully move on, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. just like you said, like bury them, open the closet, <laughs> let it all out and, you know, yeah. but yeah, I feel like it's a, it's on us now, on our generation, you know, mm -hmm. and that's why I feel like there's a lot more people uh, talking about this and trying to, you know, hopefully not only helping ourselves, but helping those around us yeah. to like unpack and then unlearn and mm -hmm. then also relearn, you know what I mean? Yes. And so, um, yeah, I just kind of, Talking about trauma, what are the traumas? Because you had posted about traumas that we mm -hmm. suffer as people from Oceania. Yes. What are some of these other traumas that we suffer from and that, mm -hmm. you know, that we need to move forward mm -hmm. from as well? Right. So I think, well, one that comes to mind is um, historical trauma. So a lot of us in Oceania have experienced colonization where we have people, foreigners coming in and taking over, right. you know, almost eradicating our people. But it wasn't even, it didn't even start with that. It was even further, what just even first contact, speaking of a pandemic, first contact, our people died from mm -hmm. disease and just that exposure. I mean, most, like thousands of people died from that. And the only people that survived are our ancestors. You know, 100% of our ancestors survived. And survival of the fittest survival yeah. of the fittest so exactly like the strongest survived and mm -hmm. then that's how we are here today that's because exactly. of exactly the strongest exactly so there's a lot of that trauma um and even with you know for example in hawaii the hawaiian overthrow mm -hmm. that's a huge historical trauma and with that too there's cultural trauma where the culture is um, suffers from its identity it doesn't even know what it is anymore mm -hmm. if it ever did exist if it exists period um, there's a lot of abuse as well. And it's a big thing. That is a big one. And it's not just, uh, it's you not know, just yeah, people ahead. think, yeah. oh no, you're fine. People think of like, you know, hitting each other. I'm like, not um, just physical, yeah. There's a lot of mental, emotional, verbal, even spiritual and right. verbal abuse. It, it comes in all shapes and there's even cyberbullying. Like that's nowadays, right? Nowadays, cyberbullying, yeah. yeah. So those are traumas that we experience too. And, um, Again, you know, we experience from those, we have a lot of depression and anxiety um, and other physical manifestations are, our people suffer a lot of heart disease, cancers, mm -hmm. diabetes, um, you know, obesity. It's just, there's so much that we, we experience and it's, it's, it's huge. It's not yeah. just, there's this concept too, is with generational trauma, it didn't start with us. It's happened many generations right. ago, and we're experiencing those effects of it. Um, but to this is kind of a segue out of this, but I think the biggest problem, though, the biggest trauma that we experience is shame in our culture. And um, <laughs> we have so much shame. And shame is mm -hmm. used as a joke. Shame is used as a weapon. Punishment. You know, yeah. As punishment. Right. And um, I think that is the one thing when you're saying, is there a word for depression and anxiety? I don't think a word existed because of shame. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's vocabulary for these mental health problems, for racism, for any other social issues yep. and mental and physical issues because of shame. And people have told me, oh, well, we don't talk about this because it's to protect the family and stuff. I'm like, excuse me. This is no. This That's is why shame. it continues to happen. That's the, exactly. This you're is protecting why. The shame, yeah. Exactly, and mm -hmm. you know, I even in one example too is of you know sexual abuse in a family. Oh. People are always like, "Oh, you're telling me your uncle did this we to you?" We all have that one. You that know, one uncle, somebody cousin, knows somebody. Someone in the family. That somebody's doing this, and there's unfortunately there's a lot of people in families that are saying, "Shh, don't yeah. talk about it." We're not going to bring this up again. Mm -hmm. And how hurtful that is. Right. And that causes a cycle. To Did keep you see going. that uh, that video on um, 
it's a little clip on social media about mm-hmm. that little girl in Texas, I believe. Oh. Um, the mom mm-hmm. came to uh, to get her, but she mm-hmm. didn't want to go because the mom's, I think it was a step dad. Oh, wow. I think I he was doing something to her, but mm-hmm. she was just like, yeah, refusing to go. And then CPS mm-hmm. was called and she mm-hmm. was just like, no. But even in that clip, she was telling the mom what, uh, what that person was doing to her but mm-hmm. the mom you know like no one believed her yeah and imagine that you know not believing a kid a little kid you know that stuff like that happens yeah and then just for the you know like the parents or like the the older people who are mm-hmm. supposed to listen to the kid who's supposed, supposed to, to help, the help this kid feel safe yeah. you know that's what you're supposed to do as a mm-hmm. parent but not being able to listen and then just how much trauma that creates in her mind you know, and then yeah. not only going to CPS, but for the rest of her life, she's not yeah. going to trust. I say that's betrayal. She's older, experiencing you know? yeah. right there, and so oh, that's so sad. Yeah, and another. Sorry, just going off of um, oh, this this uh, trauma. You know, mm-hmm. imagine like with the overthrow in Hawaii, mm-hmm. not being able to in your own country, in your own like land, speak mm-hmm. your own con- you know, speak your own language. Yeah. That not only happened in Hawaii, but like New Zealand and also yes. here in U- US with the Indians, you know, mm-hmm. or even, yeah, you know, just like the indigenous people here, mm-hmm. not being able to speak your own language. And yeah. that's the betrayal, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, these guys are supposed to come here to help us. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what they were coming for, supposedly. And then, yeah. Just the whole overthrow, <laughs> right? You know, but yeah, I kind of feel that yeah, that trauma just continues generation to generation, and mm-hmm. just like I mentioned, I feel like it's on us, you know, on our generation to mm-hmm. not only uh, to stop it, but we also need to like unpack it, right? Because there's no use of of stopping it if it's just gonna con- like uh, keep like festering, right? Or exactly. just keep like in the back of your mind. So I feel like it needs to be taking care of you like going therapy or whatever you know you need to do Mm -hmm. and so i know with you um you said that uh ocean therapy right going to the beach helped you a lot with that Mm -hmm. so what are some other things that had that has helped you and that Mm -hmm. you feel like can help others yeah okay so yeah definitely the things that doctors recommend you know going to therapy if needed taking medication also there's no shame in medication i'm gonna say that out there there's no shame in that um Let's see. I love writing in my journal. That's helped me a lot. Um, art is very helpful for some people too. Having a creative outlet with music, with dancing, and our people are so in tune with that. So having those creative outlets can help us to heal as well. But um, my biggest push though is knowing and doing family history work can really help us. To yeah, heal talk about that. This. How can like how does I guess genealogy? Mm-hmm. How does that help? with you know trauma or with this generational you know trauma that we're trying to stop yeah so i know definitely for me it's been um being able to identify where the trauma started has been very helpful for me to heal um and just recognizing and having that understanding that this is what happened this is why our family is the way it is this is why there's these harmful patterns and trauma is being passed down generation after generation that's helped me a lot and then to also have empathy be like okay you know it's not always someone did this to my family it's oh it's sometimes people in my family doing this to each other right. hurting each other you know doing these really bad and terrible things and um just realizing that and having a lot more empathy for my ancestors and um i know too that just recognizing that has opened my heart a lot more to them and to realizing that like you're saying it's my like i'm recognizing this and now it's my job to help them to rest and to heal from this and but more importantly i think what has been really wonderful for me in oceania genealogy is um recognizing the way they viewed time and um our ancestors, well, nowadays we view time as the future in front of us and the yep. past is behind us. And um, we value time in the Western world as being quick. The faster something is, the better. Yep. And that is reflective in our technology. And getting in your transport, money's worth too, right? Exactly, getting money's your worth time the is. best <laughs> for at least amount of time. Yeah. That's what we value here. But our ancestors in Oceania viewed it differently. They viewed the future as behind them and the past is in front of them. 
And um, I, I didn't understand that concept for a while until I realized that what we can see is stuff that's already happened, right? I can see that I went to Kamehameha because I did, All like right. it happened. So it must be in front of me, like this table. It was here before I even came. So that means it's already happened. So it's here in front of me. But what hasn't happened is things that I can't see. We we'll always talk about the future. Like right. I want to do this, but when it comes, it's like, well, it usually isn't what we expected, right? So if we can't see something, then it must be behind me. And, um, but as we move forward into the past, what we do and what our ancestors believed in was that their ancestors were in front of them and teaching them and showing them the mm -hmm. way because our ancestors like pretend you're my ancestor and I'm your posterity. I'm and one of your moving descendants forward. moving forward right. and you're talking to me and you can see what's behind me. Yep. I can't turn around and you're like, okay, Mia, there's this coming up. So you need to do this, this, and this. You need to be prepared. Right. So you are telling me what to do and preparing me for things that are coming up and in front of me. And that'll be my past, right? And so that's our job in Oceania. And our responsibility as descendants is to listen to the past. Yep. We don't have to dwell in it too much. Though I, I understand that learning the history is very important. I'm a huge history buff. I love history. But I think what they want us to do more importantly is to learn from them and then to take what they have left behind and make it our own. Yep. It doesn't have to be, there's this idea too that indigenous people have to be frozen in the past. It has to be this. Otherwise you're not, not indigenous enough, which is not true. That's why it's always evolving, right? That's culture. Right. Culture is meant to evolve and to change. To the time and space that you're in. Exactly. And so now that we're, sorry, I'm just taking this over. No, but you're fine. Go ahead. Now that we're living here in America, why not? use the best of the american technology that we have yeah, like innovation. and like intertwine it with the culture that you know or mm -hmm. like not only the culture but also like maybe the um the concepts you know or like yeah. the dang, what's the word like our values yeah the values and, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so those values you know mm -hmm. intertwine with technology or you know with who we are today yes and uh Man, that's amazing. Yeah. And just going off of what you're saying with mm -hmm. like looking into the uh, into the future, which is the past, mm -hmm. or you know, like when like me here today mm -hmm. is just not myself, right? I'm standing with yeah. all my ancestors, mm -hmm. and so like just like you're talking about, they got your back. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. they're the ones allowing you, or like you know, like sharing us. their yeah, sharing their their their. And then going back to the word mana, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like with mana, like you're rooted in who you are mm -hmm. because you know where you come from. Exactly. And then where you come from is your ancestors. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also your homeland too, yeah? Like yes. just that whole, like uh, your your relationship with the land, you know, mm -hmm. or with the Aina, you yeah. know what I mean? Like come from Hawaii, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like got a malama the Aina, that's you know? Right. Or, mm -hmm. And so, you know, just the, I, I, I agree with what you're talking about. And um, so I'm reading this book, um, Devita Kaili, he's yes. a professor at BYU. Yes. He's talking it's, about um, indigeneity. Yeah, yes. So that book I just posted mm -hmm. about it, and I'm reading so it. So good. Yeah, and he, to me, man, it, it just explains a lot of what my parent, like why my parent, well, especially my mom, you know, mm -hmm. why she did the things she did, yeah. is because this this um, idea of time and space, right? Da and va, yeah. Yes. And so, um, with like this da and it's da and va, and so. Mm -hmm it's like reciprocated right or reciprocal uh -huh. and so i think that's the whole the cool part of like the village life like the village mm -hmm. like uh mentality you know like mm -hmm. we're we're helping each other you know what i mean yes. and then man so this this is a whole another topic i could yeah. go off on but also like time you know like yes eight o'clock we need to be here or mm -hmm. a certain place right mm -hmm. ten o'clock we need to be here mm -hmm. and then what do we do we show up at like 8 30 right yeah. or nine o'clock mm -hmm. and so i feel like <laughs> this is not an excuse of why i'm always late <laughs> but polynesians uh so like eight o'clock nine o'clock is a western standard for yes. time right mm -hmm. but for polynesians we don't have this standard of time. Mm -hmm. When we get there, we get there. But mm -hmm. when we do get there, we spend that time, you know, or like mm -hmm. that time. that space. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't matter how long, you know what I mean? It takes me to get there. But when mm -hmm. I get there, it what matters is that time that we spend together. Yes. And then, yeah, I think that's just such a cool, you know, concept yeah. of like time. Mm -hmm. And then like me and you just spending this time together, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's kind of like, 
reciprocating, you know what I mean? Like ideas or even just like trading, mm-hmm. you know, they call mm-hmm. it talano, which is talking, yes. you know, like trading mm-hmm. ideas and thoughts mm-hmm. and stuff. And so not only with me, but also with the viewers, you know what I mean? Yes. Or the people that we're sharing with. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like that's, man, something else that we, you know, have to offer the world is just our culture. Yes. It's such a beautiful culture of like the village, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I help you, you help me, you scratch mm-hmm. my back, I scratch your back, you know? Yes. And in the end, no matter how much success you have or I have, it's all, it's never self-made, right? It's, it's always self-made. contributed to the village. Sorry, I've been talking too much. No, you're So fine. for your question, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just with this That's whole, um, the concept that you're talking about, man, I love that concept of, you know, your ancestors. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, are there other... Oh, let's talk about this. You're talking about the creative outlets, right? Yes. That you have to, like express yourself or mm-hmm. to like free yourself from mm-hmm. you know whatever's happening yeah. talk about being a pianist oh yeah <laughs> um what is the word a concert is it concert a pianist. concert yeah mm-hmm. a professional yeah pianist yeah <laughs> that's crazy thank you how did you get into that have you always been into piano and oh, yes. you know what i mean I'm, mm-hmm. i mean obviously if you're a professional concert or what you know what i mean concert but pianist, yeah. yeah that's kind of cool well thank you yeah so i um well, started with my great grandmother, my tutu, who um, just she loved music, and I was always surrounded by music. And I would sit wa- and watch her play the piano, and she could play by ear. And I was like, that is the coolest thing. Right. And I was like, I want to learn how to play the piano. And so I started at a very young age, around six is when I started, and I started learning the basics. But um, it wasn't until I got a little older that I was like, I want to keep doing this. This is really fun. I enjoyed the hard work and the perseverance that came and the reward to performing. It's just something that exhilarated me. So, um, yeah, I, I love the piano. I love classical music. It's just a big part of who I am and part of my identity, even though I'm not, um, you know, training in it <laughs> right. or performing that was my dream though going to be by you i was originally going to major in piano performance that was the goal i was like i'm gonna go to carnegie hall i'm gonna do all these cool right. things graduate from nyu and just be like yo yo ma and just travel the world you know <laughs> and perform and um i am glad it didn't work out it was it's hard sometimes but overall yeah i just i feel like my piano skills Yes, it is trained in classical and Western European ways, but when I play, I feel such a strong connection to my family. I feel like they are there listening to me as I play and as I practice, and that it's a channel, so to say, a way for us to be with one another, to reciprocate this love for each other. I know the stories of whose hymns are you know, my grandpa's favorite hymns right. and each time I play it, I feel his presence. Or when I hear a certain song being played, sometimes I can feel the presence of my great grandmother who inspired me to do piano. And so for me, that is one way that I not only connect with my ancestors, but I feel like I perpetuate the culture and in my own way. And I feel like they're just proud. Like God gave you this, you're doing something about it. And it's one way to share my love with people when they hear me play and right. when even when I play, I'm like, oh, this is, I just feel the love, sharing the love, yeah. That's what our talents are for, right? God mm-hmm. did, God gave us talents so we can share them, yeah? Exactly. He didn't give us talents so we could sit on our, our room by ourselves <laughs> yeah. and just share our talents with yes. ourselves, you know? And it's they push To bless us. the lives of others. Exactly. And not just the living, but de- most definitely right. our ancestors. And I feel like that's what genealogy does, right? It connects... Mm-hmm. Like not only the past, mm-hmm. but the present, you know, and then yes. also the future. Yes. And then, um, yeah, just with going off of what you're talking about with, you know, our ancestors being in front of us, mm-hmm. you know, to help guide us. And so, man, I think I have a new appreciation for this genealogy thing. <laughs> I just want to say that anybody can do this. They really can. Right. And it's as simple as just talking to your family. That's family history work. Exactly. Asking them like, yeah, how did I get my name? Or can you tell me what village we're from? That's family history. Just even sitting together talking, talking like story, this. Yeah. It's all family history. So I think we're already doing it. Yeah. And, um, and our hearts are already turned to our families, right? We have this concept and this belief in, at least in our church and in Christian faith that, um, 
the hearts of the fathers and the children need to be turned to each other. Mm-hmm. I will say, though, that in our culture, before colonization happened, that was already there. It was We were already facing yep. each other. And I just think genealogy is a way to have an awakening, to have us turn around and turn away from things that we can't see. Because we, it's almost like we've been picked up and turned the wrong way. But genealogy picks us back up and makes us face these things that we haven't been able to see before right. clearly. And I just think that is the most beautiful and one of the most healing things that we all need in the world. Amen. Jeez. Whew. I like that. <laughs> but it's also, you know, um, just this word legacy, you know, it comes up, right? Mm-hmm. And so when we do genealogy work or just like even us, like continuing the generation, you know, mm-hmm. not continuing the trauma, but continuing just like this legacy, right? Yes. We need to first learn of the legacy that mm-hmm. was left behind for us. Mm-hmm. And then as we continue our lives, we could carry on the, that legacy yeah. and we leave it with the people who are continuing. Yeah. Like you, for you, your mm-hmm. son, or, you know, mm-hmm. like the kids or our nephews, nieces, or, or the people, you know, mm-hmm. that are going to, because there's still people yet to come, you know, yes. and so they're going to continue that legacy. And so I feel like that's what genealogy, how it all ties in, right? Yes. It's just this legacy mm-hmm. of the past, present, and the future. So Yeah, I think what you're saying is basically it's our job to be a good ancestor yep. now. And yep. that's our role. And we can do it. I think most of us already are doing it. And you're right. It's as we do good things for ourselves for our health, for our bodies and our families and our careers, whatever, that it's making us be the best ancestors that our posterity needs already. And as we listen and more fully turn to God, whether those who are listening are Christian or not, like I I truly believe that as we turn to God, that he is preparing us to be the best ancestors, the ones who are the example, the ones who pass down this powerful legacy, whether it is passed down or whether it's made, we have the power to do both. Or we're breaking the bad legacies. We all have the power within us to do that. And that power is is so real. And it's recognizable in family history work. That's why I always, always talk about it. I'm like, this is what it's all about. It's meant to do good and be good for the future good. Well, I don't think we need anything else. <laughs> well, that was it. You know, that was Yay. just as powerful as she can put it. And there's nothing more I can add to this. But again, thank you for your time. I just have a few questions, you know, sure. to end this. Yes. Just some rapid fire questions. Okay. So let's do this. You know, now, uh, now is the easy part, you know, what Ooh. takes up too much of your time? Okay. <laughs> oh, you're good. <laughs> what takes up too much of your time? Oh, what takes up too much of my time? Sorry. Um, probably my phone. What do you wish you knew more about? Um, definitely more about my ancestors. Yeah. I want, I'm very curious about my German ancestors and my Japanese ones. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to find you guys. I'm going to find out. And you know, what is cool too, especially in the Samoan culture, it's such a big, you know, like German and uh, oh, yeah. Chinese or Japanese. Well, Chinese mostly, uh, but mm-hmm. there's some Japanese, there's I guess, in there. There's a big influence yeah, of that. exactly. And I think it's so beautiful. Also in Tonga, too, a lot of German. Germans, yeah. yeah. We have like Wolfgrams, Wolfgrams and whatnot. Exactly. I was the actually just Bloomfields. reading. <laughs> yes, the Bloomfields. I was actually just reading a record of um, a Wolfgram, Ludwig Wolfgram who left Germany and it said where he traveled. I followed on Google maps, how he got there. Wow. He stopped in, um, in Egypt and took a train all the way to Jerusalem for a few days. And then he got back on the boat, went to Italy, went down to Australia. Then he went to Tonga and that's where he settled and had a bunch of children from his third wife. So Jeez. there's a lot of rich yeah. history with the Germans and yeah, German Samoa from 1900 to 1914. I'm very proud of all that heritage. I hope everyone else is too. (laughs) Um, What's your favorite book? Ooh, favorite book. Right now it is um, this series by S.C. Perkins, um, Lineage Most Lethal, and Murder Once Removed. It's a genealogy mystery series. Nice. Um, What or who inspires you? My grandma my grandma Teresa she is she's one of the most God-fearing people I know and that's why I just I love and 
admire her. What are some things you had to unlearn? <sighs> to um, not be too prideful I, and be humble about things. And I think, too, with my very dominant uh, personality to tone it down a little bit. <laughs> um, it can hurt people sometimes. So just being more sensitive to those around me. <laughs> What's special about the place you grew up? Um, the temple, most importantly. For sure. What have you only recently formed an opinion about? Huh. Um, I think... Oh, yeah. Cars. <laughs> what kind of cars are good and what kind of cars <laughs> suck? Mainly for my husband. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> what's the luckiest thing that's happened to you? Oh... Um, having my baby boy. Yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. What song will guarantee to make you dance? Love on Top by Beyonce. It's a go-getter. <laughs> uh, what are you most looking forward to in the next 10 years? Ooh, okay. Um, attending law school in two years, getting my PhD, and teaching at BYU, and becoming a certified professional genealogist. So, and maybe having more children. <laughs> that's what's up i like that i have my i have my plan there you go i'm gonna go, Man. I'm gonna go get you know it. i mean not that it's a wrong answer but you know <laughs> most people just kind of like give a vague answer like oh i want this or that you know like, oh no i know what i want. I know for you <laughs> to come out like boom boom, boom i know what like, i want hey, that's what's up <laughs> um what could you give a 40 minute presentation on with no preparation oh yeah polynesian genealogy polynesian True. oral genealogies the history of hawaii history of samoa um, yeah, basically anything Polynesian genealogy. What hobby would you get into if time and money weren't an issue? Um, sewing and, um, <laughs> being like a hairstylist. <laughs> yeah. Nice. When people come to you for help, what do they usually need help with? They need help Easy. with genealogy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's something you think everyone should do at least once in their life? Travel to their ancestral homelands. Yeah. There's something powerful, right, about oh, yes. traveling Making home. Making that pilgrimage home. Which of your scars has the best story behind it? My left knee. I ate it on my, I was riding down a hill in Tokyo on my bike, and I ate it so bad. I stopped traffic. <laughs> I was riding on the road, and I stopped all traffic both ways. I have this nasty scar. But as my dad said, I left skin in Tokyo, so nice. I'm proud. <laughs> Blood, sweat, and tears. That's right. <laughs> Uh, and finally, if you could give back to your village, how or what would you do? I would do what I'm doing now, but just do it forever and constantly just help people find their ancestors and more importantly, be proud and continue to do good in their lives. Amen. Well, again, oh, sorry, before we take off, um, where can people find you? And what yes. services can they, what do services do you offer that you can help people with? Yeah, thank Sorry, you. Sorry, I forgot to no, you're put, fine. put that in earlier, but yeah. Totally fine. So yes, everyone can find me on Facebook and Instagram um, at the Polynesian Genealogist. On Twitter at Mia Jensen. Um, I'm still working on my website, but you can hit me up still. The Polynesian Genealogist.com. And I do professional genealogy work for individuals and families um, y'all can hit me up and yeah, I just love doing work for people. So yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, again, thank you for your time. I appreciate you sharing your story. Thank you. I'm sure, you know, other people will find it is inspiring just as it is powerful. So thank you. yeah. Well, again, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the village made podcast. It's a privilege and a power to be Polynesian. And these are our stories and our stories are powerful.